today's presentation, um, Complementary Curiosities, um, three collectors of antiquities in 19th century Philadelphia, complements um, a little exhibition of the same name that's just been installed on the museum's third floor uh, in the introduction to the Classical World Gallery next to the great big map. Um, and that is, those names are so pretty. You've seen it, uh, that's the main text panel uh, for the exhibition. And um, um, it's just gone up. The exhibition um, originated in an art history seminar that I taught in last year, in the spring of 2012. Um, and um, after a few weeks of considering the great uh, classical collections, uh, particularly of Greek vases, I just brought this in. This was the very first slide that I used in the class. Um, so I thought, OK. Um, so we looked at the great classical collections, and we particularly focused on Greek vases, because that's my interest, in the museums of Europe and the United States. Then the class did um, research on the Mediterranean sections, 19th and 20th century collectors and donors. Now much of the Mediterranean sections material, of course, comes from our own excavations, but a good deal also comes from these donors and collectors. Um, and again, this has nothing to do with what I'm talking about. This is William Hamilton uh, there on the left, and that is a view of the uh, Antiqui Domini in Munich, but it was related uh, to the course. Okay, um, I'm grateful to the members of that class, there were more than three people, um, for an incredibly interesting and stimulating semester. I did have an ulterior motive uh, here in doing the class. As we moved, as here in the museum, we moved towards our online database, it seemed important to find out as much as we could about the sources of our material. Also, I'd done some, some of the research myself and found it fascinating. Endless hours on ancestry.com. And um, <laughs> yes, they're all smiling because they spent endless hours on it with their own collectors, then we move into our own families. And um, anyway, it's fascinating. Often this would give us additional information on the objects, um, this research, um, but also provided detailed pictures of prominent Philadelphians of the late 19th and early 20th century. So I thought it would be a good project for part of the class. And the connections of these donors and collectors to other cultural institutions in the city, Philadelphia seemed a small place in the late 19th century, held out the prospect of doing cooperative projects, research, but possibly also exhibitions. So I had these sort of ideas in mind. The uh, online database was certainly a, a spur to this. Um, but it seemed like a good project. Um, I'd enjoy doing what I had done, so I thought the students would as well. And also, I would give us the opportunity to make connections with other institutions around the city uh, in the same way that these 19th and early 20th century Philadelphians had. And again, with the prospect of doing some cooperative, collaborative projects, uh, again, research, but possibly also exhibitions. Now, for three of these students, Sarah Beckman, Jacob Finkel, and Anne Glasscock, the seminar wasn't enough. And they developed the plan for the small exhibition which highlights the collectors that they studied. They are my co-conspirators today, and they'll each present in a moment. And um, um, I'm going to introduce them now so that we don't interrupt the flow. Um, <coughs> the first person who will be speaking is Jacob Finkel. Um, Jacob um, is he is a submatricular in the classical studies department, which means he's getting a BA and an MA um, this year. He has finished his thesis on Cicero. Um, Jacob, is, Jacob does a lot with Cicero, so he's doing his master's thesis on Cicero. Um, a second speaker is Anne Glasscock. Um, Anne is a graduate student in art history at Temple, and um, she is uh, finishing up her uh, master's degree this year also. And the third one is Sarah Beckman, who is in the Art and Archaeology of the Mediterranean World Graduate Program. And um, um, she's completing her third year and is reminding us that she is almost done with her classes, um, having uh, just about completed her third year. Um, okay, so.
So um, they'll be speaking, they're my co-conspirators, um, and um, they'll come up individually to talk about their own donor. Um, before we do that, though, I'd like to thank a number of people who helped make the exhibition happen and also who fostered our work on the donors and the collectors. Um, our special thanks, of course, always to our own museum archives, to Alex Zadati and Eric Schnitzke, who were incredibly helpful, both in the class and, um, um, and um, with other questions outside of that. Um, I'd also like to thank, of course, our exhibits department, Kate Quinn, Marion Casey, Kevin Schock, Courtney O'Brien, and Alex Ramsey, um, and some uh, uh, who um, put the exhibition together in the midst of um, trying to do some other big project. The exhibition's opening soon. What is that on? <coughs> oh, yeah, right, yes. Anyway, they very kindly uh, managed to squeeze that in. Um, also, for helping with um, getting the objects together, Thanks to Lynn Mikowski, the keeper of the Mediterranean section, to our conservation department, Lynn Grant, Julie Lawson, and the other conservation staff members um, who worked on the objects. Um, outside of the building, I'd like to thank Susan Anderson, who is the Martha Hamilton Morris archivist at the Philadelphia Museum of Art, and also Linda Young, who is in the registrar's office at the Philadelphia Museum of Art. They were both um, incredibly helpful um, uh, to us on these projects. And finally, there are other people um, in archives and institutions across the city, uh, who I won't name, who helped us find material relevant to our donors. Again, that was one of the great things about this, was that we had to go out uh, and find things in other institutions. Okay, as I said, the class worked on the Mediterranean section's late 19th and early 20th century donors and collectors, and here they are. Uh, and I managed to choose three photographs that have each of our speakers in them. Um, I always forget to do this till the last day of class. Um, so um, it's a little contrived, um, and everybody's laughing, um, because it's the last day of class, I guess. Um, in any case, so we worked on the Mediterranean sections, late 19th and early 20th century donors and collectors. And we put together their biographies and also looked at what they collected with a view to understanding them, but also with a view to understanding what and why they collected. <coughs> Here, um, the students are looking at the collections of Francis T.S. Garley, who Anne will talk about in a moment, whose collection came to us through the long-term loan from the Philadelphia Museum of Art. Um, and um, uh, we're also looking at, uh, in fact, that's the object they're looking at with the magnifying glass, um, a little vase from the collection of William Nickerson Bates, a Penn Classics professor who's also a curator here and who traveled in Greece in the, in the first decades of the 20th century. So we looked at some well-known donors and collectors, both for the Mediterranean section and for other sections. Um, our old friend E.B. Burst and John Wanamaker. Um, but we also looked at some donors and collectors whom you might not know about, at least not in this particular capacity. Uh, one of them is Joseph Bonaparte, uh, Napoleon's older brother, who spent nearly two decades in Bordentown, New Jersey. Um, and we have several vases that came through Joseph Bonaparte. Um, we also have material from William Sansom Box, who was a mineralogist, among other things, who was closely associated uh, with the Academy of Natural Sciences. And we'll see that a number of these donors are actually linked <coughs> through um, friendships established through their interests. In many cases, were natural history, and they were associated with the Academy of Natural Sciences. Um, a couple of my favorites: Robert H. Coleman, who was a, um, a iron magnet, and um, he lost. He was one of the richest men in America in the late 1870s, he inherited it. He wasn't very old in the late 70s. Um, but he lost it all um, by the early 1890s, although he lived for more than 30 years. Um, and when they were selling off his assets, they auctioned off a uh, collection uh, which, uh, which we purchased all of. So Robert Coleman, we have lots of things from the Coleman collection. Uh, Mrs. Bloomfield Moore, her material came to us largely through the Philadelphia Museum of Art uh, long-term loan. 
And um, she's the sort of person who has endeared herself to museum people everywhere. She had her collection established in rooms in Memorial Hall in Fairbrook Park, which is where the Philadelphia, which is where the precursor of the Philadelphia Museum of Art was. And um, she kept keys to the cases so that she could go in and take things out when she felt like it and change the labels if she didn't like them. Um, so um, she was a great favorite, and there's much correspondence about this. She has to be able to do this. Uh, this was mostly her husband's collection, and the collection was in his memory. In any case, she was always moving things around, and I think you can see she's a formidable lady. Um, we also have material from Dr. J. William White, um, and you see his wife in a rather vivacious portrait by John Singer Sargent. Um, and um, on the left is her husband, Dr. White himself, here in the Aikens uh, painting of Agnew Clinic, the one that we own, uh, as opposed to the one that the Philadelphia Museum of Art owns, of course, the Rose Clinic. So there he is uh, participating. Dr. Agnew's over here doing the lecture, but Dr. White is there doing some of the work. So we have material from this very prominent Philadelphia family. And finally, just to stay in the Aikens vein, uh, we also have one Etruscan mirror from Fairman Rogers. <laughs> Fairman Rogers was um, an engineer and an art collector. He was also a coaching enthusiast. And you see him here in the Aikens painting, a May morning in the park, that Fairman Rogers four in hand. And he is here actually um, driving the coach. Uh, he was a coaching enthusiast and clearly a participant. Um, and he wrote, he wrote a manual of coaching um, in 1900, which is still uh, an authoritative book. He's a very interesting uh, figure um, here in the Aikens paintings. Okay, but in addition to all these collectors, and there were many more that we haven't talked about, you know, there are nine people in the class, ten people, and in addition to these, there are three collectors, our featured ones today, that Jacob, Ann, and Sarah will be talking about. Jacob will talk first about Robert H. Lamborn, and Ann will come and talk about Francis Thomas Sully Darley, and Sarah will finish up with um, Henry Charles Lee. So I am now going to turn it over to Jacob, who will come and talk to us about Robert Lamborn. Thanks so much. Um, good afternoon. So I'm going to talk to you today about Robert Henry Lamborn. And uh, in particular, I, obviously, uh, as we've seen, the museum has a large number of donors. So in particular, I want, I want to talk to you about what I think makes him unique, which is his Stockton philosophy and kind of the unique collections and Stockton plural that he created and how, and how he went about that. So starting out with his background. He was born in 1835, and his parents, Robert and Rachel Pierce, uh, were very active members of the Society of Friends here in Philadelphia. And that uh, influence became a very important part of his, of his philosophy, and the kind of Quaker ideals really informed how he went about building and then, and then donating his collection. And his maternal uncle, Jacob Pierce, was one of the first librarians of the Academy of Natural Sciences. And as it turns out, he was such an early librarian that he, at one point, had the entire collection of the Academy in a closet in his house. <laughs> so, so young Robert Lamborn was able to go to his uncle's house, look in the closet, and that was the entire collection of the Academy. And that was, that was kind of influential for, for him and how, what a collection should be and how accessible it should be to people. And when he had the opportunity, he went abroad uh, for his education. He went over to Germany first, where he got his PhD in 1859. And then, in order to raise money to continue his studies, he published in 1860 a, um, a book on the metallurgy of copper and then a, a sequel um, on the heels of that great success in 1861 as well. And then had the opportunity to study uh, at the Royal Saxon Mining Academy and in Paris, and really had a, had a first rate, um, cutting edge education for that time, really you know, advancing on the forefront of, the, of these fields. And then, after he returned to the United States, he served in the Civil War and it, under um, Captain Jackson Palmer in the Anderson Cavalry, and he was at the Battle of Antietam, 
which, um, as, as you may know, was the single bloodiest day um, for American soldiers in American history. 23,000 people were killed. And he served on the staff of General um, John Fulton Reynolds. And there's an interesting, this is General Reynolds. And General Reynolds uh, was, was there at Antietam. And then, uh, a few months later, in the Seven Days Battle, in June 1862, he was exhausted. It lasted seven days. So he found a quiet place where he could sleep. And in the middle of the night, his, his army retreated without him, leaving him <laughs> in, in Confederate territory. And when he was captured, he was brought to the Confederate general, who happened to be an old West Point um, classmate of his. And he admitted to his friends from, from West Point that he was mortified by the circumstances of his capture. And his friend, but his friend reassured him, Reynolds, don't feel so bad about your capture. It is the fate of wars. So that, that's um, Lamborn's superior officer. And after the war, he was twice elected, Lamborn was twice elected the city surveyor for Trenton. And he was involved in a number of interesting projects, uh, largely out west, and uh, such as he helped colonize Pikes Peak, seen here. He was, he was very involved in the development of Duluth, Minnesota, which is now the fourth largest city in Minnesota. So his influence was very wide, widely felt. He was the director of the Lake Superior Railroad that connected um, Lake Superior to the Mississippi River. And he was, then came back to Pittsburgh where he was the first chemical expert for the Pennsylvania Railroad. And his education in Europe had really helped him establish him as someone who could be doing all this work. And in Pittsburgh, he got to know Andrew Carnegie, who said, he about Lamborn, he wore kid gloves, which were then rare in Western Pennsylvania. This fact rendered him somewhat an object of suspicion at first. Year after year, he gained more and more the respect and confidence of all of us, and finally became a friend. So obviously, he had a very wide-ranging group of, of admirers and acquaintances. And it was also at this time that he became interested in a, in a slightly different problem that he later published on, which was that when you're out in the swamps and you're out, out in these rural areas, there were a lot of mosquitoes. And he thought, which is really a pretty advanced uh, ecological conception in this, in this era, that perhaps the introduction of dragonflies was the ultimate solution to the mosquito menace. So he actually, once he had some money, he, he offered a reward for anyone who could successfully do this. And he um, published, with, it, with his instruction, editing a book, an entire book, uh, with um, expert opinions on how this promising possibility, which unfortunately um, for us, I think, in Philadelphia didn't turn out to be, didn't work out, but perhaps there's still potential for that. And then, after the war, it, he, was, he was, again, involved a lot out west, and he was, um, helped install some of the first poke blast furnaces that were installed west of, the, of, the, of Missouri. And he was uh, the Pennsylvania Railroad engineer who was in charge of transitioning the railroad from, from wood into iron and, um, and, to, and the, introducing the use of coal. And he also became, as he was out on these territories, he became interested in what he termed the primitive inhabitants and ethnological objects that he was coming upon there. So it wasn't that he, that he first established his interests and then he went over there and found them. It was that he was there in these places and he became interested in the places where he was and collecting and learning about the people who had, who had lived there. And he actually had the opportunity to be on the United States Centennial Commission, who represented Wyoming. And then um, in 1878, he actually represented the United States in Paris. And he was assigned um, Prussia, Belgium, Holland, and Mexico, as well as sections of Europe not otherwise assigned. So he, had, he was given a kind of diverse um, set, of, <laughs> set of countries to be responsible for. And then his crowning achievement in, in his business career was the Mexican Central Railroad which the um, dictator, Porfirio Diaz, had decided he wanted to have built to expand Mexico's railway. Um, in, in 1877, Mexico had 700 miles of railway, and they wanted to expand that to 12,000 miles by 1900. And Lamborn was both instrumental in this and made a huge amount of money to, um, being responsible for this. And he, he was based um, in El Paso, Texas, and then in Mexico City for seven months. And the, um, this is actually this is actually a picture of the early Mexican railway train. And he, he made so much money off of this that he was able to retire at the age of 50. And while he was there in Mexico City, what he brought back, and this included a large amount of money, was a collection of 80 paintings that he gathered from all over Mexico City. He bought them at auctions. He got them from convents. He, he was, he was um, really remarkable in his, in his wide-reaching um, collecting enthusiasm. This is a picture um, of the Reverend Mother Maria Antonia de Rivera. Um, and you, you can see the... Um, Crown, the flower crown, this is the day she's being initiated um, into the order. And this is just one of the paintings that, that now hang in the, in 
and his book part of the PRMS. And it's interesting that his collection, while while impressive and very large and expensive, was not at all on the same level as other multimillionaire New Yorkers. And he, he moved back to New York, and other New Yorkers were collecting, you know, Titian and Rembrandt. And he had this kind of strange esoteric collection of Mexican paintings. So it really, really did stand out. And he actually wrote a pretty authoritative book on Mexican paintings and painters in 1891. So he was both a, a collector and a, and a scholarly enthusiast. This is another um, grouping of his of different things he had collected. The, um, these, these were carvings that, that were made in prisons in Mexico and sold to benefit, they were made by the prisoners and sold to benefit the prisoners. And he collected them and eventually gave them to the PMA. But a, uh, the Philadelphia Inquirer at the time, their opinion was most of the pieces in the Lamborn series are without art or merit. So you can see, you can see kind of where, where this is going. <laughs> then he had the opportunity after he retired to travel to Italy uh, and spent kind of the last 10 years of his life really devoting it to collecting and building a bunch of different collections of a bunch of different items. <coughs> a lot of which have now ended up here with us in, in the University Museum, mostly, mostly through PMA loans um, to us. And then a large number of his items were exhibited in Memorial Hall, which is then the PMA. And it was a very large exhibit. It had a really remarkably wide range of items. There's a silver medal given by Napoleon III to the uh, French Mexican Mexican expedition. It didn't turn out so well. There's there's um, images, copper coins with Marcus Aurelius on them. Uh, a really, um, we have Bucco vases, and and uh, you know it's just an incredible collection of stuff. And the Inquirer did did like this exhibition. Um, they said the visiting was up. And you can see, uh, upon entering the gallery, the visitor will find in the central case a considerable collection from these tombs. And this is a collection of, of the um, Book of Vases that he had brought back. And also, as, as it says here, a thousand pieces of Roman glass, <coughs> three, uh, a couple of which you can see here. The top one is um, cameo cut glass with a white relief on the uh, black background. And this is a remarkable picture that we have that really highlights uh, Lambert's involvement. <coughs> this is him in the foreground in Dalton Door, the um, curator of the PMA behind him, sitting in the room in the PMA where his items are being displayed. So you can see that, that the Mexican paintings are there on the wall. You can see, those are actually, you can see the three, the three uh, Roman bust pieces, which are actually the only three in his entire collection. It was interesting that he would have those three on display. And you can see uh, some vases there and, and over there. And, and some of these actually we have in the museum with us today. So it's really phenomenal to be able to see him there. This is another picture of his pieces arranged. We also have some of these. And this is a schematic of Memorial Hall at the time. And his pieces were displayed in room J. So a really impressively large uh, portion of the museum was being given over to his collection. And this is, this is another view of his collection. You can see it's taken, so he, he would be he's sitting over there. And in a letter uh, written in 1893, he says to, um, to, the, to the PMA, after the conference with President Pepper and yourself on the 11th, I shall not object to my objects um, being, being rearranged as will better comport with your plans for the museum. But as we concluded at the, meeting, at the meeting, changes shall not be made to lessen more than is absolutely necessary in effective display of my things, and that they shall be kept as much as possible together and not made less effective. So he's not quite, he doesn't quite have the key to the collection moving around, but he's, he's, um, he's given them over, but he's still, he still wants to make sure they're, they're kept and displayed together. And then in terms of his, his philosophy of giving, he gave to a whole wide range of, of institutions here and in New York. He only gave, he gave his private library to Penn, but the rest of the items were given to the PMA and then have come to us um, th through, through loans. But he, his only stipulation was that he would only give to museums that did not charge an admissions fee. And he urged the museum that he gave to to be open on Sundays to allow as many visitors as possible to, to see them. And near the end of his life, he, he, had, he had lived in New York, and near the end of his life, he bought a house in Philadelphia. And some say that he was becoming more Philadelphian. So perhaps if he had lived longer, he would have given even more to us. But unfortunately, he died suddenly in 1895 in, in a hotel in New York and after a slight, apparently trivial indisposition. And, and Clara Barcanelli, uh, who has written a lot about him, says that his, 
philosophy was really informed by the fact that while he did have he did have a home in New York, he spent a lot of time in these hotels. He died in this hotel, which he had spent a lot of time in. And so he didn't have a grand home which he wanted to decorate. And he also had this Quaker vision of giving back. So that was kind of why he would build these different collections and then give them give each one of them away. And he was survived uh, by his sister and by his brother. So I just wanted to focus on Charles B. Lamborn for a moment, because after after Robert Lamborn died, the collection passed to Charles, and there was a uh, long-running legal battle over where the collection should be and who should control it. And I just think it's interesting that Charles was only three years younger than Robert, but he spent an additional 20 years working on the railroad because he didn't have he wasn't as successful as his elder brother, so he actually needed the money. And in this long-running battle, eventually, um, eventually they came to an agreement that, that, that the Academy of Natural Sciences got its pick of the items, and it only took a handful of items. And the rest of the items were transferred to the PMA, and then from there we received a, a, a nice number of them. And, and that's kind of a very brief <laughs> overview <laughs> of our Yeah. leading citizens of Philadelphia have been claimed by death in 1914. A railroad president, a widely known art collector, three judges, the foremost single chess champion of the world, <laughs> a capitalist, and our former assistant district attorney died. The acclaimed art collector was Francis Thomas Soli Darley. Born in Philadelphia in 1833, Darley was the son of William Henry Darley, a prominent music teacher, and James Chester Soli, portrait painter who exhibited in Philadelphia and other art societies between 1825 and 1869. Additionally, Starling was the nephew of watercolorist and illustrator Felix Octavius Starling and grandson of the artist Thomas Soli. He studied under West, and he painted this uh, portrait scene here which captures Francis and his mother Jane in sort of idyllic landscape with the urn and the Starley would go on to marry Cecilia Baldwin, daughter of Matthias W. Baldwin, and founder of Baldwin Locomotive Works. Professionally, Starley followed in the footsteps of his father and found a career in music. He served as the organist and choir director at the Church of the Holy Trinity, which to this day stands at the northwest corner of Rittenhouse Square. In, addi in, excuse me, in addition to arranging religious music for the church, he also composed music for two operas and a magic film. Additionally, he was the first vice president of the Philadelphia Orchestra Association and a member of the Historical Society of Pennsylvania. Like many wealthy citizens of the 19th century, art and the collecting thereof became a pastime for Darley. He housed his collection of fine and decorative art in his home at 510 South Broad Street in an area of Philadelphia known as Millionaire's Row. Designed by Frank Furness, he has been described as, quote, unquestionably the handsomest resident on South Broad Street and one of the finest in the city, containing many rich art treasures. Starley purchased the residence from Cecile Field Moore, who you saw a portrait of earlier, and you have heard about Elizabeth, uh, a fellow patron of the arts, who sold the house to Darley around 1878 upon the death of her husband. In 1900, Darley had architect Charles Burns renovate the house in the French Renaissance style. In regards to how Darley displayed his treasures in his newly renovated home, we are fortunate to have a detailed inventory of his possessions, which lists each object room by room. Of importance to this presentation are the antiquities that were located in the study and displayed in what he referred to as the cave cabinet. In this cabinet, we find antiques, uh, casts of children, beads, vases, cups, um, fibula, strigil, and a long list of lamps. Um, one of the you know, he describes as being to uh, sort of recreate this cabinet from what 
we have fairly few possessions here in the museum, and I'm no expert in Photoshop, um, but this is what we came up with. <laughs> um, the cabinet is, of course, very common. Um, all that we know of the so-called K cabinet that he owned uh, was that it was Dutch, presumably purchased in Venice, and probably much more elaborate than what we have in here. Um, so you may recognize some of the items from the list in the previous few slides. We have candy sticks, Children's keys, vases, and all these really nice stuff here. The inventory list that we have just seen is important as it reveals both the provenance and convenience for some of the items in Darley's collection. What it doesn't reveal is specifically why he purchased certain objects over others. In Darley's case, to obtain, to obtain such information in regards to his collecting practices, he list, must let the objects speak for themselves. Judging from the variety of antiquities that he acquired, we can see that they were generally smaller objects and were likely souvenirs bought on his travels in Europe. He seems to have based his purchases on whether or not an object was interesting or aesthetically pleasing, as opposed to a more scholarly approach based on an item's historical value or function, for example. Generally, Darley's antiqu antiquities weren't of the highest quality, but they are important as they represent the collecting practices a particular collector in a specific time and place. After a long life working as a musician and collecting works of art, Darley passed away in Atlantic City on August 22, 1914, at the age of 81. His personal property, including his collection of art, was appraised at nearly $674,000. Darley bequeathed his valuable collection of paintings, furniture, decorative works of art, and antiquities such institutions as the Metropolitan Museum of Art, the Philadelphia Museum of Art, Pennsylvania Academy of Fine Arts, and the Franklin Institute. And it's by this uh, shift in collecting policies of the PMA and the University Museum in the 1920s that Darley's classical works of art found their way into the university's collection. Uh, at that point, museum officials set a clear boundary such that the University Museum was to be one of archaeology and ethnology, include works of primitive and ancient civilizations, while the PMA was to present works of art from, quote, the time of Christ, Buddha, and Confucius to the modern era. Uh, therefore, many items in Darley's collection first went to the PMA, and they thought highly of several objects when they arrived at the museum in 1914. In fact, their museum refers to the antifics in Dupperware Pantheros in a 1915 bulletin as, quote, a valuable addition to the representative collection of Etruscan ceramics in the museum, a fifth specimens of their respective works. The museum also received a $30,000 request bequest from Darley, a collection of Greco-Roman pottery, and a large cabinet described as having elaborately modeled bronze ornamentation. Additionally, the students of the School of Industrial Art who willed a collection of European bronzes, porcelains, and carved cabinets. After Darley's bequest and bid to be removed from the estate, all remaining artwork, furniture, and household items were sent to the Philadelphia Art Gallery to be sold on November 2nd of that year. The following year, in 1915, the Darley Mansion came on the market. John G. Johnson, Darley's neighbor, purchased the residence. It was reported that Johnson, also an art collector, would use it to house his current collection of pictures. Both the previous residents, Mrs. Bloomfield War and of course Darley, would bequeath their art collections to the PMA. And Johnson's works of art would also <coughs> eventually find their way into the PMA's gallery. The John G. Johnson collection is known as being, quote, one of the finest groups of paintings assembled by an individual in the United States. He painted masterpieces by Italian, <coughs> Flemish, Dutch, German, Spanish, French, and English artists. Clearly, a, a collecting of art was a prominent leisure activity for wealthy Philadelphia citizens, and much can be gained from learning about the lives and collecting practices of the Philadelphia owner. Thank you. century collector that I've been researching for the last year, Henry Charles Lee. 
Those of you who are familiar with Lee likely know him as the singular man who donated his entire library, his books, manuscripts, and the physical room that contained them to the university upon his death. Lee also left behind a large collection of antiquities, over 90 pieces of which are now in the Penn Museum, donated by his daughter Nina in 1921 and his son Arthur in 1931. What sets the Lee collection apart from the others we have discussed today is the overall quality of the pieces. Nearly half of the Greek vases in the Lee collection are currently on exhibition. The Panathenaic Amphora of the Berlin Painter is one such piece, now on view in the complimentary curiosities case, which you should all go see after this talk. <laughs> we selected this piece for the exhibition because it is representative of the Lee collection. Many of the vases are unique and rare. They were likely, likely valued for their art appeal and purchased by a discerning collector. One of the difficulties I've encountered in the course of my research into this collection has been determining the precise identity of that collector. Although my research is inconclusive at this point in time, I believe that most of the Henry Charles Lee collection was originally curated by Henry's father, Isaac Lee. My discussion of the collection today will therefore discuss both Henry Charles and Isaac Lee as collectors, as both played important roles in the development of this private collection of ancient artifacts. Henry Charles Lee was born in Philadelphia on November 19, 1825, the second surviving son of Isaac Lee and Francis Kay. He and his older brother were educated privately in the liberal arts, in ancient and modern languages, <coughs> mathematics, philosophy, and the physical sciences. From an early age, Henry was interested in classical languages, in Greek and Latin poetry in particular. He wrote his own translations and composed original verses in Greek. He was equally interested in the biological sciences. He was a published author and had presented to the American Philosophical Society by the time he was 18 years old. In that same year, 1843, Henry entered his father's publishing business. He became a partner in 1850 and continued in this capacity until he retired in 1880. Henry attempted to continue his education while working at the publishing house, but unfortunately, the demanding schedule took a physical toll on him. He suffered a nervous breakdown in 1847 at the age of 22. He would be plagued with ill health for the rest of his life. His doctors advised him to abandon his intellectual studies for some time and focus on his health and his business. It was not until the early 1860s that Henry began again to seriously engage in scholarly research, this time into the history of the Middle Ages. Henry preferred to work with original sources and primary documents. In order to do this, he purchased scores of medieval manuscripts from collectors and dealers in Europe. When it was not possible to purchase the material he wanted, he commissioned others to transcribe personal copies for him. The acquisition of primary source materials for Henry's studies is well documented in his personal paper, now in the University Archives. Lee meticulously <coughs> preserved his correspondence with his dealers and scholarly contacts abroad. He also had a moderately sized collection of Italian master drawings, which he began collecting in 1880, inspired by his father's own collection of the same. He kept a journal for this collection in which he recorded where, from whom, and for how much he purchased the drawings. Lee put great effort into documenting acquisitions and keeping inventories of his collections. That he would not do the same for any ancient artifacts he might have bought is curious. The records preserved on the acquisitions of medieval manuscripts and Italian art set the firm precedent for how Henry operated as a collector. I suspect that Henry himself did not purchase most of the vases in the Lee collection. His collecting habits suggest otherwise. The pieces in the Lee collection suggest that they were carefully curated. The quality of the vases in particular, the fine paintwork, and their intactness are evidence that the collector valued both, as, both aesthetics and authenticity. There are less than two dozen vases in the collection, which is further evidence that quantity was not privileged over quality. The rest of the Lee collection consists of small bronzes, decor decorative figurines, and objects for personal adornment, the types of things you would buy in curiosity shops. This leads me to believe that the pieces in the Lee collection were purchased from dealers and or at antiquity shops in the mid 19th century. Such vases and small bronzes like these in the Lee collection were easier to purchase abroad than in Philadelphia, in major European art cities such as London and Paris and in Italy, where pieces like these were excavated from Etruscan tombs. Excavated in air quotes. Um, I suggest that Henry Charles, the Henry Charles Lee collection was actually formed by Henry's father, Isaac Lee. Although father and son were similar in many ways, both worked at the family publishing house, devoted their leisure time to scholarly pursuits, and were fond of Italian art, the two led very different lives. 
Henry suffered from nervous disorders and was prone to physical illness and fatigue for most of his adult life. He rarely left Philadelphia, and most of his scholarly research on the Middle Ages was conducted using source materials in the comfort of his own personal library. Isaac, on the other hand, became an internationally renowned naturalist and scholar who engaged in intellectual activity across a broad spectrum of contemporary disciplines. Isaac Lee's life and own personal writing suggests that he may have purchased some of the pieces now in the Lee collection well abroad, and later handed them down to his son Henry as family heirlooms to keep, display, and treasure. Isaac Lee was born to a Quaker family living in William Wilmington, Delaware in 1792. He moved to Philadelphia at the age of 15 to launch a wholesale importing business with his brother. This early business venture was short-lived, but pivotal in that it introduced a young Isaac to the world of business and to the cosmopolitan city of Philadelphia. When Isaac married in 1821, he entered his wife's father's publishing business, which later became known as Carey and Lee. Isaac assisted in daily operations of the publishing house and simultaneously pursued his own scholarly research in the evenings. This is the model that Henry unsuccessfully tried to emulate. Isaac was interested primarily in the natural world, in mollusks in particular. He published his first paper on mollusks in the Journal of the American Philosophical Society in 1827. The study of mollusks at this time was quite new, and Isaac easily became the leading expert in the field, <laughs> in part because he worked with an extraordinary research collection of American mollusk specimens, which he himself had amassed. Friends and learned contacts in the United States sent specimens from all over the East and Midwest, which supplemented the specimens Isaac gathered while living in Philadelphia and Delaware. I think that this research collection of mollusks shaped Isaac's philosophy towards collection and acquisition. He liked to be physically present for and directly involved in the selection of objects. Moreover, his renown as a naturalist garnered invitations from scholars abroad and his European travels were the means through which he amassed the bulk of his impressive collection of Italian master paintings and drawings. Most of this art collection was purchased in 1852 to 53 when Isaac, his wife, and their daughter Frances took a 19-month tour of Europe. Scientific research of mollusca and the natural world was the primary goal of this trip, but the family spent a significant amount of time, nearly nine months in Italy, during which time Isaac purchased 192 paintings and assorted drawings from dealers in Florence. A few of these paintings and many of the drawings are now in the collection of the PMA, and curator of drawings Anne Percy, Anne Percy has done a remarkable job tracing the formation of this collection through Isaac Lee's travel journal. A detailed account of the trip is preserved in 14 handwritten travel volumes, now in the collection of the American Philosophical Society, which illuminate the important but forgotten patron of the artistic and natural world in Philadelphia. The journals are filled with intimate details of Lee's interactions with conchologists and other natural scientists, and are thus important sources on the global intellectual climate of the 19th century. They are also full of personal nuances and reflections, which provide a window into Isaac Lee and the social circles in which he moved. I've been working with these travel journals, re-examining them as primary source documents of an American's experience abroad and the role of antiquity in the 19th century. The 1852 to 53 trip introduced Isaac Lee to a number of ancient Italian sites and ruins and I believe spurred his interest in classical antiquities. The family spent the autumn and early winter months of 1852 in Florence and traveled through Rome and the Bay of Naples in the first quarter of 1853. Isaac meticulously records the cities, sites, and museums that the family visits. Although Isaac was rather disappointed with Rome as a city and a capital, it was far too dirty, it was here that an interest in ancient art blossomed. Isaac may have first come to appreciate Greek phases as aesthetic art objects in Rome at the Vatican Museums. He is particularly taken with the Hegeus' Amphora of Ajax and Achilles plain dice, shown here. He remarks on the intricate details etched into the black paint and on the dynamic contrast between the black and red colors in Anastasis. The journal also mentions purchases of antiquities, though not to the specificity we might like. On January 10th, Isaac visits shops with antiquities, cameos, mosaics, and paintings, and buys a few small affairs at the curiosity shop. On February 4th, before the family leaves the city to the Bay of Naples, he attends to gathering some purchases of bronze and marble busts and figures, which he packs up the next day to send back home to Philadelphia. Images preserved of Lee's home, located at 1622 Locust, attest to the display of vases and marble busts in his home. 
I have to say here that Professor Brownlee and I have looked at these pictures in detail. We can't quite ascertain the antiquity or of these objects or whether they're modern replicas, but there does look to be perhaps a canthra here on the table. We're still looking at these. More research is necessary to establish a clear collection between Isaac Lee and the ancient objects now in our museum. I've applied for a fellowship at the American Philosophical Society Library, which would give me the opportunity to read the journals in full. Because they provide specific dates, places, and names of individuals Lee encountered in Europe, they can assist in reconstructing where objects might have been purchased, from whom, and by what means. A comprehensive reading of all the travel journals can help establish the network of connections and recreate a picture of the antiquities market in early to mid 19th century Europe, which may increase our understanding of the Lee collection as well as the, as the motivations that underlie the formation of art collections at this time. Research into the museum's 19th century collectors also assists us in reestablishing the provenances and post-depositional lives of many of the objects in our collection. The Berlin painter Ampra, I mentioned earlier, is a case in point. The Ampra was donated to the museum in November of 1931 by Arthur Lee, the son of Henry Charles and grandson of Isaac. The vase was of great interest to the Mediterranean section curator, Edith Hall Doan, who had seen it at Lee's home and desperately wished to examine it. When the museum received the vase in 1931, conservation removed the black overpainting on the reverse and revealed a painted scene of a youth. A postcard preserved in the Penn Museum archives from Greek vase scholar Sir John Beasley to Doan in 1936 notes that the Berlin painter Ampera had previously been listed as number 53 in the Emil Braun collection in the sales catalog of Christie's February 21st, 1850. It was again listed in the Christie's sale catalog of May 18th, 1853, but this time in the collection of a Lord Monson. My work indicates that much of the Braun collection did not sell in 1850 and is again on sale at Christie's on February 13th and 14th, 1851. If you notice here in the description of the Berlin painter Ampera in the 1850s sales catalog, the youth on the reverse has not yet been painted over. Um, how the Ampera moved from Braun's collection to Monson's and somehow later to Lee's has yet to be established. Braun and Monson offer themselves up as new 19th century collectors to investigate. Furthermore, Emil Braun, who owned the Berlin painter Ampera at least until 1851, was a German archaeologist and secretary of the Instituto di Correspondencia Archeologica in Rome, the forerunner of the DAF. Further inquiry into Braun as a 19th century archaeologist and antiquities dealer may one day help us verify that our Berlin painter Ampera did indeed come from a tomb in Bolchi and we may one day even be able to suggest original tomb group. My work with the Lee Collection has thus far impressed on me the importance of continued research into the collections of the Penn Museum. Objects have multiple stories to tell, as do the 19th century owners of these objects. I hope that my ongoing research into the Lee family and their collection will add to our understanding of the reception of the ancient world and the role that classical archaeology and collections of ancient art might have played in 19th century Philadelphia.